Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Coach Me Plus. Coach Me Plus is the leader in athlete management software and a product that we've been lucky enough to implement here for over two years now. The product in and of itself is exactly what you need it to be, guys, with options ranging from being a workout provider, as in sending the workout directly to the student athlete's phones, to being a place where you can communicate with them and bring together multiple streams of data to be its own dashboard for you, your coaching staff, or the athletes. Or you can use what we've added to our our menu of Coach Me Plus activities, and that's Hydration Station, where all of this information that is provided is based off of research from the Corey Stringer Institute, where we're looking at weighing in versus weighing out and then providing optimal hydration uh, strategies for the student athletes by them selecting through the menu and tapping on what they'll take home with them and what they're consuming prior to the next practice um, when all the numbers at the top are lined up green. It's something we've had really good success with and the kids have really bought in on. Just another great example of the awesome product that you can find at coachmeplus.com. Guys, hop over to coachmeplus.com today and check it out. It's a product I guarantee you won't be disappointed with. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content it provides, be sure to hop over and check out the community. The community is an exclusive members website that is just an extension of what we do here in July at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar. What it is is a combination of video lectures, a coach's corner with your Monday morning take-home information, and a forum where you can talk about anything and everything related to the field of strength and conditioning. In the community, you'll find content added each month from some of the top practitioners in the world, ranging from PhDs to high-level coaches, bringing you exactly what they're doing with their athletes or their research at the present moment. On top of that, an additional discussion by coaches bringing you that Monday morning information things that you can add to your training program right away. Tying that in with the opportunity to discuss with coaches around the world in the forum on anything and everything from the topics addressed in these presentations to whatever you're seeing in your daily life as a coach. If this sounds like the right thing for you and your staff, go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and try it out for 48 hours for just a dollar. If you like it, you're signed up, ready to roll, and you're jumping into all the great content added each month. If not, feel free to go ahead and cancel at any time. No questions asked. We're really excited about what we're building in the community and hope you are too. Go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have a sensational discussion with Denver Broncos strength and conditioning coach and Landau Performances, Lauren Landau. Guys, Lauren gives a quick little rundown uh, of how we got into the Broncos and and the transition from the private sector and working in, you know, a lot of combine prep into the National Football League, you know, and and really dives into the new challenges that he sees and where there are similarities between the two roles. Uh, You know, in the next, one of the things that Lauren's really, you know, well known for is his work with fighters, and we get into that quite a bit. You know, he discusses what he's done in MMA, he discusses his role in developing those athletes and some of the really unique uh, obstacles that come with working with high-level fighters. This talk leads right into a really, really interesting like step-by-step progression of how Lauren has gone into the world of monitoring and where they started when it was just pen and paper type stuff to where they are now with with more like high-level athlete tracking type things. You know, and, and we really finish off discussing about how he sets his groups up uh, in Denver, what KPIs they're looking at, and really, like, the characteristics that he's looking for in these groups to develop and how they program accordingly. Guys, this is really an awesome talk. I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Lauren, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So, hey, listen, for the one person who's living under a rock who doesn't know who Lauren Landau is, let's give them the quick rundown <laughs> where you're at, how you got there, what what you're doing, and in the, in the whole nine. Sure, sure. I, I've been real fortunate. The uh, uh, Two months ago, I took a position with the Denver Broncos as a head strength and conditioning coach. Um, you know, I've, I've been born and raised in Denver, so it's obviously 
you know, been the team that I've watched my entire life. And, uh, you know, I think once you get into this field, at some point in time, you're thinking, wow, you know, that'd be pretty amazing to be over there and to be involved and to be able to help that team. And uh, sure enough, uh, I was up for the interview position, I think it was eight years ago now, um, right after the uh, lockout. And uh, I was runner up to a great coach in Luke Richardson. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate to get uh, called up when he took his post uh, with the Houston Texans and uh, came in and, uh, you know, had some uh, great meetings and interviews. And uh, uh, the rest is history, as they say, and uh, retained uh, a couple of the staff members that were of the previous regime and then brought on one other gentleman from the University, uh, from University of Kansas. But um, prior to that, I had owned and operated Lando Performance, which is literally, Jay, 20 seconds from here in a car. So my, my, my commute got 20 seconds shorter uh, with the change in uh, jobs. But, uh, you know, it's great. Uh, I have 22 coaches over at Lando Performance, and they're, they're rocking and rolling. They're doing the darn thing over there. We just got – I went from one freight train to another. We, I got done with combine prep and – made my transition over here right after the uh, NFL combine and, and start drinking through the fire hose right away. Once I got here, (laughs) let's talk about that transition a little bit because, you know, going from the combine prep where everything can be really regimented and really like laser focused to dealing with a massive sporting organization with a, pretty interesting collective bargaining agreement with the players. Um, How has that been? How has that been rolling? You know, it's been interesting, right? Because when I'm in the private sector, I'm kind of a jack of all trades. Uh, You know, if I, we'll just take, for example, getting guys ready for the combine, you know, it's one of those things where I might serve as the performance coach, uh, a little bit of sports med staff, a little bit of the nutrition side. Well here, you know, I have, and, and don't get me wrong. I have the team of people uh, within our location that do a lot of those things, but you know, you're, you're wearing multiple hats still, and you're really trying to un- uncover a lot of things where here I have a team that really helps to try and uncover a lot of that. Now in the preparation of combine prep, you have these kids that are, you know, they're, they're looking at this opportunity to combine prep. And as you said, it's very regimented. We know what we're going to do day in and day out. I control all variables. Um, I know the days I'm going to go acceleration. I know the days I'm going to put them on, put it on them on the squat side of things. And then I know the days I'm going to, you know, open it up top end speed. So I make all those decisions. Well, you know, now being within the team side, now I've really got to do a lot of audibles and make a lot of changes based on uh, all the other coaches and what they may be doing and what they want to influence at, uh, you know, certain times of the off season. So um, it, it's an adaptable model. Uh, I think, you know, we, we talk about it best as being fluid and, and making good decisions on the fly that, that help the athlete and don't hurt the athlete. Oh, no doubt. And, you know, I think something that would be probably really neat is understanding how that transition went. Because when you're talking about, you know, you did have a staff, or do have mm-hmm. a staff, but the T-shirt had your name on it. Right. Where now the T-shirt has the Denver Broncos name on it. So how is that going to allow you to be able to to be a little more laser focused in specifics? And where do you think having that past experience of the management realm and having to kind of dabble in everybody's space a little bit is going to help carry into that situation? You know, that's a, that's a really good question. And I thought about it a lot when I originally interviewed for the position, uh, as I said, eight years ago, and people asked me about that. And I said, you know what? The funny thing is I wasn't ready for that position. And they said, well, what do you mean? What do you mean by that? I said, well, in that time, I built a business. I brought on staff members up to 20 plus staff members that I had to train and mentor and lead. And eight years ago, I wasn't in the position to lead. I could lead athletes. And I've always been in management, but to actually build something from the ground up and really see some failures and have to make some tough decisions along the way with personnel, uh, I think allowed me to be more prepared for this opportunity the second time around. Now, to your point, you know, when I'm over, when I was at the, in the private sector, you know, I juggled a lot of balls, right? I kept a lot of balls up in the air. Well, now I have one really big ball that I've got to keep up in the air. So 
So it, it, to your point, I've, I've, able, I've been able to maybe have more laser focus in what I'm doing here without trying to manage so many different variables when I'm uh, a business owner and managing all the different aspects. And not to mention, you know, communicating via agents, communicating with all the different people that I had to um, in, in just the marketing attempts and the, the outreach programs that we do. So uh, luckily for me, I have a great staff that can now take over that and they can start to see what I was doing this uh, for the last 10 years. So, yeah, but I just don't want people to get the misconception that all that Landau Performance is is just a, a combine prep business. You know what? The, the combine prep is, is really just one sliver of what we do. Uh, you know, like any good private sector performance facility, you know, we service the whole gamut of the LTAD kind of model of, you know, the young athletes to the middle school age athletes to the high school athletes, a lot of collegiate athletes of all sports. And then, uh, you know, our, I'd say our probably and, and then we have the professional athletes in the NHL, uh, MLB, a little bit of NBA, not much. And uh, our, our biggest population outside of uh, American football is uh, the MMA, the mixed martial arts crowd. Last year, we provided uh, training camps for over 150 fights. So uh, we're, we're pretty, pretty busy with that population for sure. You know, and that's a real unique subculture in the sporting world. So let's, let's kind of bounce around that a little bit because it is so different. The, the one thing when you look at, at those men and women, and, and I don't know if this is still prevalent, but the one thing that's always really blown my mind is how they have so many different places that they go. <laughs> how in their physical prep would you guys handle that? Man, you know what? It, it, just like we talked about at the beginning here, where you have to be fluid and you have to ask a lot of really good questions. So what I did when I first took over uh, working with this fight team ten years ago, I had a fighter of mine that came up to me, and he was one of my he was one of my ironic one of my football players who turned into the fight world, and said, "Hey, I want you to train me for fighting. Uh, can you help me out?" I said, "Absolutely, would love to, but I don't know a thing about your sport." So what I did is I just started watching fights and I started paying attention to the fights and really had no grasp of what was going on. You see the brutality of it and you, you see the, the, the work to rest ratios of five minutes of fighting one minute down. And you're like, well, how the hell do I prepare somebody for this? And so I think everybody's mindset goes, well, you got to make it hard and intense. You've got to make it metabolic and, Oh, I got an idea. Let's make it close to the metabolic demands that they're going to be dealing with in the fight itself. And let's go, these long circuits and these short rest periods, which as you and I know both, uh, you know, guys will work hard, but uh, you're not getting much out of it. So I, as I did more research, I paid attention a little bit more. I started going to all the fighters practices because I'll be honest with you, Jay, when I first started working with the fighters, I was just putting it on them coming up with, you know, what I felt were creative metabolic circuits that challenged the guys within a relative window of what their, their demands were going to be. So I started going to all their practices. I was like, oh, my gosh, these guys have upwards of 13 practices, 13 practices a week with three strength and conditioning sessions. OK, if you look at if you look at 13 practices a week and if you break down the energetics of really how those practices are run, the, all the practices are basically hitting the same energy system over and over and over. So I started to think to myself, I was like, well, let me give them what their practices aren't giving them and let me give them what their sports aren't giving them or what their, their, what their competition isn't giving them. So I started really making a big swing of the pendulum the other way and said, you know what? Strength and power development is where these guys need to be. Um, and you've got to be mindful of weight classes, right? You can't do a traditional periodization model and say, hey, you know, we're going to take this 135 and we're going to put him on a, a three to four week GPP prep and, you know, give him some good hypertrophy work and, you know, because next thing you know, you've done something 16 to 20 weeks away from a fight that's going to make that weight cut hard the last week of the fight. So you have to be mindful of what's coming down around the bend when you're getting ready for a fight camp. So I swung the pendulum to the right pretty far. And then I started noticing, like, if I put these guys on a pretty good, you know, whether it's a, a squat day or something that we're working good strength power numbers, they go to wrestling practice. And guess what they couldn't do? They couldn't wrestle very well. And so what I had to do is I started going to all the practices, started talking to all the coaches and really said, okay, I need to help these athletes and not get in their technical 
preparation uh, practices. I can't get in the way of that. So I came up with a in-camp model that was really a, a daily undulated model where one day I had a more of an alactic day, another day where I was more of a lactate day. And, it, and depending on where we were in camp, it was more of a capacity day. The closer we got to a fight, it was more of a power day. And then we had our very last day, which was an aerobic day, which was truly like an opener for the guys. We did it on a Friday before their sparring. And so everything that every day that we built into our training program had a place to, to, uh, to uh, really stimulate a quality that maybe we had built on in the off season, but helped retain that quality as the camp went. Well, the reason why I put the lactate day, to, day in is as you go to most of these practices, most of these practices from, from the starting whistle to the end, they're pretty much go, go, go with that traditional 20 seconds of rest in between. And so these guys were just doing what I considered like mass capacity work. They were, they were diving into the aerobic you know, zones quite a bit into their tactical sessions and their lactate capacity zones in their tactical sessions. Never were they actually hitting on their, what I would consider the, more of their lactate power. So we just started you know, putting in these specific days to help work with a gap that I saw in what they were getting in their tactical preparation. That's awesome. So how was it just a visual that you were using or were you monitoring these guys in other ways? No, you know what? So 10 years ago, I, I did my poor man's uh, monitoring system and I gave my guys an Excel spreadsheet that had every day of the week and it had every discipline. And then I gave them a red, yellow, and green. And I said, do me a favor at every practice this week. I want you to mark if this practice was a a red, yellow, or green. Red meaning it was hard, but then um, also put the duration of the practice next to it. Well, lo and behold, as I said, they had 13 plus practices a week and I'd get their sheets back and I'd see 11 to 13 reds, okay? So I was like, okay, there's a major problem here. So I, I, I started, so all the coaches, the, the, all the coaches from the team really never talked about what they were going to do. So here I am, the, the performance guy saying, hey, we need to communicate, we need to talk. And I brought in their sheets to the coaches at a, at a team meeting and said, look, regardless of what you guys understand about performance, I don't think this is a good vision um, for the development of your athletes. And I, I showed all the reds and the coaches were like, well, that's funny. Gosh, we, you know, we did a, a jujitsu practice and it was, you know, I would have called that a yellow. I said, yeah, maybe it would have been a yellow on a Monday. I said, but the fact that it happened on a Thursday it was perceived as a red. And so what I started doing was just communicating to these coaches of, of what you perceived as a coach of what you put on paper versus what was the actuality based on the accumulation of fatigue throughout the course of the week. So I, that's when I started to get my buy-in quite a bit. And then I got to the point where the coaches, uh, the wrestling coach, Leister Bowling, he started calling me up during camp saying, hey, you know, this has been the time frames of my practices, and now we're, we're three weeks out. What do you think I should do? And so it was brilliant. He was asking me periodization strategies, knowing darn well that he needed to augment and change something. And I just said, hey, you know what? Let's start cutting out the volume. Let's raise the intensity in the practice, but let's cut down the volume. Let's give him more rest. And uh, so it, the communication worked out really well once I could provide them something. Now, you know, now our monitoring systems that we do, we're partnered with a, a group called the Resilience Code where we have a lot of great monitoring tools that we use with them from the HRV to, you know, all their different, you know, neurocognitive testing that we do pre, uh, pre job, you know, recovery rates in between bouts and uh, post sessions. So, you know, it, it's changed quite a bit and the landscape has changed. The, the, I'd say the sport itself still has um, some old school thought processes, but the team that we work, the teams that we work with, allow us to really do some of the scientific uh, interventions. Could you run down a little bit with what those neurocognitive tests are? You know what? It's, it's as simple as the DynaVision, right? It's the DynaVision yeah. that, you know, they, they, get a, uh, they get their score and then they put, put into the, uh, the progression of it is then the reading while you're doing the, dyna, the, the reactive aspect. That's awesome. So it, you know, how has that been like post-fight with guys? Yeah, well, gosh, right. There's a trauma yeah. component too, right? And so because of that, the, the resilience code is headed up by Dr. Chad Pressmack, who is the neurosurgeon for the Broncos. Dr. Chad Press, uh, Pressmack is also the guy that, that 
you know, it helps um, educate on the concussions, helps clear on concussions, and helps give protocols when our athletes uh, suffer any type of head trauma. So good thing about that, right, we have, we have a baseline. We have a baseline on guys from that. We also have a baseline on all their um, concussion testing protocols, but we also have the neurocognitive as well. So it's pretty unique post-fight, you know, whether it's just the pure trauma from the fight or the, the, the exertion of training and or what type of damage was sustained from the fight. Oh, yeah. I mean, because you, you take getting punched in the head or getting thrown on your head mm-hmm. and up to five five-minute rounds. Like, I would almost be interested to see, like, if there would be a way to determine – whether it was traumatic or fatigue based. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. And that, that's the good thing about it. We've never used it in a sense of, uh, you, you know, peri session, but we have used it. It's always used as pre session for us. And so we use that. We use the finger tap. We use a, a, a four minute heart rate recovery test, uh, you know, just a, a low intensity run and a, a heart rate recovery test. Uh, that these guys do each and every day when they come in to train just to see where they're at. And we also have the Burtec uh, force plates where we check their RSI each and every day. And again, they're all just being used as, as tools to help us uh, best manage their process. That's awesome. When you're looking at RSI with, with MMA people, as opposed to looking at it with, with field sport athletes, <laughs> how does that differ? It does because, you know, that's a quality that you will see diminish in the, in the course of a training camp. The amount of volume that goes up and where that volume of training is really dictated, you know, you'll, you can see a downward trend. It's not like this, this one-time peak and taper of a speed power event where you think the RSI is just going to climb. But what it does is it just gives us a good sense of, of, you know, hey, you know, this guy's RSI is really dropping. We've got to make sure that he's not doing any additional conditioning outside of here. Uh, you know, we've got to make sure that, you know, check his sleep, make sure that we're checking, you know, what, what, is, what is his strength numbers like. Just using it as another tool to make sure that he's not going too far off the other end. Uh, we've had that situation with fighters in the past, right? You put them in a good strength power block. They've got beautiful RSI numbers. They're, they're trending really well. And then they get into a training camp and all the fighters increase their training load and you just start to see that thing plummet. Well, you have to start looking at like, what's a better predictor of, of fight preparation? Will it be their RSI score or is it going to be their heart rate recovery after a, 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 a sparring session or after a challenging metabolic session? So you just have to sit there and say, well, what's my priority in what I consider a staple of, of measurement of their fitness? No, I love what, what, what their key what what their key performance indicators are. What does this person need? Right, because what's important has got to be what the focus is. And yep, RSI might not be the most important thing when it comes to having a yep. fight for twenty five minutes. Yep, my my combine guys, it's a really good indicator if we're if we're trending right in our training. Uh, but in our fighters, I don't think it's really I don't think it's a strong lead. Yeah. So now coming back to where you're at now. I know sometimes when you're looking at monitoring and performance-based things and, and recording information, when you're dealing with people under a collective bargaining agreement, there's, there's some gray area and negatives there. Are, are, how much of that are you able to utilize in the league? And how much of that are, did you bring with you to help with the guys at the Broncos? You know what? I mean, they've, they've already had a great system in place here and, you know, if, if anything, I've been trying to do catch up on, you know, everything from Catapult, you know, in the private sector, I haven't quite had the budget for, uh, you know, Catapult systems and understanding, you know, the GPS and really how it's uh, a tool that can be used to really help shape uh, what you're doing and, and maybe, you know, the ability to push on the gas a little bit more or the ability to pull back a little bit. But uh, for us, you know, we just look at it as a marker of, of getting a sense of, you know, if we know that uh, a speed is an important quality that we have to, you know, we have to touch to retain that quality, we just want to make sure that guys are touching on those speeds that we want. We pay attention to, um, you, know, all, all, you know, a lot of different variables. You know, for each position, there's different variables that have more of a correlation to what their KPIs are. And so we, we don't get too concerned in what their maximum velocities are for a position that, 
it really doesn't matter. But we have other metrics that we'll look at that maybe are more um, significant uh, for the intensity of that practice or the effort that that player gave. But, you know, as, as of right now, for me, it's really it's a lot of discovery with it and just understanding uh, the uh, Coach Lamondo, who was here uh, long before I was, has really taken a good, strong uh, grasp at all that material, and he really has it really dialed in to, for the metrics that we use for each position. Now, I'm sure that establishing KPIs, too, with athletes at that level is really important for them. How are you communicating that and how are you establishing those, whether it be with your staff or, or with the actual athlete? You know, I think it's funny enough is, is you try to educate the athletes on, look, if you're, if you're the speed power athlete and, you know, you, you, you know, your priority is to have good explosiveness and that bend around the edge. You know, we try to explain to them like, hey, when you're outside of here, it's not about, you know, going and doing the additional conditioning and the cardio and trying to have them understand like what's important as far as what will make them successful. Like you have these certain t gifts and tools. Don't hurt yourself by going out and doing more of what you think is going to put you in better shape, but it's actually working against you. So I think from a player's standpoint, we want to educate them like your job or your task is to be explosive as can be. And here's the window of where you need to train for that. You know, there's a repeatability aspect, but a lot of these guys, you know, they, they just have it in their head. They, they just want to be in great shape, great shape, but there's not a lot of understanding of what great shape means, what, what it truly means per their position. So we try to educate them on that. Um, but as far as the coaches, you know, in, in our realm, like we have a pretty good sound understanding of what the KPIs are needed for each position and how we can best influence them. That's awesome. So, so then how do you guys break those down um, and communicate that within both, you know, the, the performance staff and then, you know, with different position coaches and, and through the front office? You know what? I, I think for us, we, we communicate it to our athletes pretty. We kind of lead them. So, for example, when we're setting up our workouts here, you know, if we have our offensive group coming in, you know, our speed power guys, our, our, our speed guys are going to work on their speed qualities first. Our guys who are more the road graders and the hand-to-hand -hand combat guys that need to be strong and powerful in the phone booth, they're in that weight room first. So that's how we really break up their, their KPIs and really train them accordingly. To me, I want my perimeter guys to be fresh so I can, I can get after some good speed uh, qualities. And then my same thing for, for our interior guys, we need to make sure that they're fresh and able to, uh, you know, put, a, you know, put good uh, efforts into the bar. Mm -hmm. No, I love it. I love it. Cause I think that, I mean, like right now I bring up the KPIs because we had, uh, we had Keenan Robinson here last summer talking about some stuff with those of swimming. And now mm -hmm. I'm lucky to have Dan coming this summer Oh, good. To hopefully tell me how awful I've been at trying to figure out what those things are. Uh, and I think that right now, like, I think KPIs are going to be the new, like, sexy term for our profession because we have such a hard time identifying what our profession is doing. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. I think people do throw out KPIs, and, and I've probably been, been guilty of throwing it out when I really didn't quite understand the term or really what the KPIs are. And I, I will say the KPIs probably evolve in my lens of an athlete in front of me. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you, you know, I think if you do a good job of sport modeling and you do a good job of paying attention to the sport, you get a sense of, like, what's this guy's task? What's his job? And where is he deficient, you know, with your needs analysis? And then you sit there and say, well, his weaknesses may be that can lead him to doing his KPIs better or, or leading him to have a better, uh, a better toolbox of uh, KPIs. Yeah, no doubt. And I think too, to kind of piggyback with that, one thing that a lot of us look at is like, okay, so what things do they do bad? Mm -hmm. but what if it's <laughs> the fact that they don't do those things well is what makes them do the things that they do really well exceptional man that, that's a, that's actually interesting that brings me up to an awesome conversation i had last night with one of my uh fighters and this fighter of mine was talking about um in her strengths in fighting her jiu-jitsu and her her muay thai her tight distance fighting is her x factor it's her superpower and because of that 
she quit training them. And she said, I really wanted to work on my weakness as well. Her last two fights didn't go quite the way she had hoped. And the problem was she was spending so much stinking time on the things that she wasn't good at. And she wasn't giving the attention to the things that she was magnificent at. So it's ironic that sometimes we want to try to bring up those weaknesses. But what we do is we, we kind of surrender our strengths and we quit working on those. And I think that's a massive problem when we look at a needs analysis. No, 100%. You know, and it's, it's funny because it's, We've got, you know, being in basketball, we, we, you know, there's really, there's like two guys, right? There's like the shooters, and then there's the guys that get to the rack. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, those shooters are going to be your aerobic animals. Who, the better off their aerobic base is, the longer they can go and keep their legs under them. Knock wood, the more <laughs> that thing's going to find the bottom of the net. But then you've got the, the freak show guys who are going to go and jump you a 45 and are going to mm -hmm. be able to take up from the free throw line. Who Maybe that aerobic base is not the best thing for them. Right. You know, so it's like, when are we going to do things to fix you, air quotes, or are we just going to do things to make sure that more makes Jay the best Jay? Boom. Yeah. Exactly. No, I love it, man. I love it. So let, let's get out of here with this. Where do you see all this going? Because this has obviously been probably the biggest 20-second move anyone could make. <laughs> yeah, you know what? It's been awesome. I, I get asked that quite a bit. Like, you know, are you enjoying it? Are you – man, are you kidding me? I've got the best job in the world, number one. Uh, but number two, like I, I'm in a position where I have a chance to lead men um, and, and lead a group to something that's bigger than ourselves. And to me, that's what matters is trying to all, all row in the same direction. I always say it even when I was at Lando Performance, I want to make sure that my team is all rowing in the right direction. And if we're not rowing in the right direction, why aren't we? So to me, like I, I know I was born to lead. I know I can lead men. Um, my, my, the way that I do it is a little bit different. I'm not the bark kind of guy. I'm the kind of, you know, consistent. I'm going to, I'm going to stay on you. I'm going to, we're going to start at the same time every day. I'm going to say the same words every day. And at some point you're going to see that my consistency is so damn annoying and, and persistent that you're going to buy in. <laughs> so, and I think we've done a good job of doing that so far. We just got through with uh, phase two and we've had, we just had exceptional buy-in within this, but uh, you know, we're having some fun and you know, my, my hope is that uh, you know, what we're doing here in the off season really transfers and, and leads to these guys being able to perform well in the season. Yeah. No, man, that's fantastic. I love it. And best of luck out there, man. Cause you know, it's, we'll talk a little bit about the, how cool I think the situation is for you personally after this. Being a guy that grew up in upstate New York yeah. and, like, the situation that you're in as a fan and a guy working there, we'll laugh about this later. Those of you listening, too bad. <laughs> uh, but I, I can't thank you enough, man. This is fantastic stuff. People are going to love it. Thanks for spending the time today. Well, I appreciate it, Jay. Thank you so much for having me on. And, you know, you put out such great material, and you're always trying to move the bar forward in our industry. So, one, it was an honor to be on, but uh, two, uh, keep leading from the front the way you are. Appreciate that, man. That means a lot coming from me. We'll be in touch real soon, brother. Thank you. Boom. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. And a huge thank you to Lauren Landau for spending the time with us today. Guys, I mean, open, honest, candid sharing, just fantastic stuff, step-by-step -step breakdowns of everything that's been going on and how Lauren's been building things. This, this is absolutely sensational. Lauren, I cannot thank you enough for being so open, honest, and candid with us today. This, this is killer. And I, guys, as always, I, I truly do hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And if you did, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. Again, we are just trying to get the best information possible out there to all the great coaches out there. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.